Hello, uh, my name is Robbie Tulip. I have the great pleasure to welcome David Fitzgerald, uh, the author of uh, Nailed uh, and uh, of uh, several other books which we'll uh, discuss over the next hour. And uh, I, uh, just to uh, a few words of introduction. Uh, my work is with the Australian Student Christian Movement. And, uh, and one of the themes that, uh, that we have is taking a critical approach to Christian faith. So the idea that if faith does not, is not uh, critical, then it's in some sense uh, inauthentic or, or hypocritical or, or dishonest. And, and that's, it's a really big challenge to, uh, to work through these issues in terms of theology. And so over the years, I've, I've taken an interest in, uh, in a number of authors who've taken a very critical uh, approach to um, Christian origins and uh, made some discoveries in terms of the history that are really very surprising for Christians. And, and my view is that I, I love the, the ethical framework of, uh, of the Gospels. And uh, so I, I'm interested in how it's possible to um, hold to that ethical framework while uh, adopting a, a critical approach to um, the history and the theology. And this is where um, an author like uh, David Fitzgerald uh, has some, some really uh, important contribution to make. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, I've just uh, made a couple of uh, PowerPoints um, that's, that we can, uh, that I'll just uh, talk through uh, to, to introduce uh, David for you. So this is David's Amazon page with, um, uh, I hope you can see that on the screen, David. Right. Um, so it, it lists uh, his books in, uh, this is the Australian version, so they're Australian prices, and you can pick, pick them up on Kindle for uh, for quite a good price. So I, I just picked up, uh, I've got nailed somewhere in a hard copy, but I, I picked up a Kindle uh, copy to, to read it for $7.06. The Christian myths that show Jesus never existed at all. Now, this is, uh, as we'll discuss, uh, viewed by Christians as a completely outrageous claim, and uh, I really look forward to to exploring this with David over our talk. And he's followed this up with uh, several books on uh, Jesus mything in action, and uh, one on the Mormons contributed to a rebuttal of uh, did Jesus exist by the uh, famous uh, Christian historian Bart Ehrman, and uh, also written a couple of science fiction books. Uh, I'll just read uh, the um, left sidebar uh, to, uh, to introduce David. David Fitzgerald is an atheist activist, historical researcher, writer, international public speaker and novelist. He was the co-founder and director of the world's first atheist film festival and San Francisco's oldest annual Darwin Day celebration, Evolution Palooza. He's best known as the author of Nailed, Ten Christian Myths, that show Jesus never existed at all, which critically examines the historical evidence of Christ and the Complete Heretics Guide to Western Religion series, including the Mything in Action books shown above. The uh, uh, CH Complete Heretics Guide uh, series, as I mentioned, includes those books and uh, tackles the secular arguments for the historic Jesus, examines all our historical sources, and finally, takes the reader on a time travel expedition through the real origins and evolution of early Christianity. And he's also with his wife, the co-author of, of the exciting and acclaimed Time Shard science fiction uh, uh, trilogy. So um, to... Uh, um, now, uh, I'll just read some of the praise uh, that... Um, various authors have um, expressed for Nailed, because I, I think it helps put it in context. Uh, Earl Doherty, author of The Jesus Puzzle, said that uh, Nailed is possibly the best capsule summary of the mythicist case, 
this is the view that Jesus was a myth and not a real historical person I've ever encountered with an interesting and accessible approach. Robert Price said Fitzgerald summarizes a great number of key arguments concisely and with new power and original spin. I really learnt something from him. Recalls classical skeptics and Bible critics, a surprising amount of new material. Uh, Frank Zendler uh, called David the brightest new star in the firmament of scholars who deny historical reality to Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, Richard Carrier um, commented that uh, when you look at the 10 modern myths about Jesus dissected here, Fitzgerald has hit the nail on the head. All 10 points are succinct and correct. A nice readable introduction to the top 10 problems typically swept under the rug by anyone insisting it's crazy even to suspect Jesus might not have existed. So uh, what are these 10 myths? And oh, uh, before uh, uh, inviting David to respond, I'll just uh, read through them and then uh, we can, uh, I'll just open up with a few questions. So the idea that Jesus was a myth is ridiculous. Jesus was wildly famous, but ancient historian Josephus wrote about Jesus. Eyewitnesses wrote the Gospels. The Gospels give a consistent picture of Jesus. History confirms the Gospels. Archaeology confirms the Gospels. Paul and the epistles cor corroborate the Gospels. Christianity began with Jesus and his apostles, and Christianity was totally new and different. So uh, I, I will show this um, final slide to uh, talk about some of the, I, what I'm hoping to do is go through these um, 10 myths uh, with David uh, and and then uh, open up some of my questions about some of the response to Nail and um, oh, we've lost David. Uh, I'll just wait for David, hopefully, to come back into the um, into the meeting. Apologies. So I'll just continue reading the um, uh, so. Uh, Welcome back, David. So why theologians find it difficult to talk about uh, this information and how, how Christianity evolved from previous religions and if the earliest Christians actually thought that Jesus was imaginary, then what does that say about um, theology and our current models of, of faith? I'm really interested in the role of astronomy in the construction of the Christ myth. And looking at the bad reputation of the church today and how dialogue about these issues can affect the social standing of Christianity. And a thing that I'm really interested to explore is whether, how mythicism could be compatible with a reformed scientific Christian faith. So David has a as I mentioned, a background in uh, history, in evolution, in atheist thinking. And um, it, uh, what we'll do is I'll stop the share and I'll uh, invite David to just uh, respond to uh, to some of those uh, things that I've said. And well, I've got you sideways at the moment. <laughs> oh, no. Let <laughs> me see sure if it's possible to, to get you right way up. Um, no. Thank you. And uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that as an introduction, David, and, and uh, hand over to you to, to comment, please. Fair enough. First, first of all, sorry for all the technical glitches. We're literally on opposite ends of the planet from each other, and sometimes it's more apparent than others. Are you seeing me okay now? Are you hearing okay, me okay? That's great. Yep, perfect. Okay. Yeah, I think I worked out the bugs on my end, so hopefully we'll have better connectivity through the rest of it. Um, so <laughs> that said, so where should we start? Where should we start, Robbie? Look, I, I think, you know, why did you write Nailed? Because, uh, you know, you've got a background as uh, uh, in the atheist movement. Uh, most atheists aren't actually particularly interested in the, the detail of, uh, of Christian history that you, uh, that you explore in Nailed. 
and the funny thing about that is um, I was raised Southern Baptist, but I had been a, an atheist for 16 years. If you had asked me 20 years ago, uh, if I thought there was not a Jesus, I would have said, but what? The thought never entered my mind, across my mind that there might have been no Jesus. Um, but around 1999, um, I read a terrific little book called uh, Ken's Guide to the Bible. And one of the things it pointed out was how different Jesus is from gospel to gospel. And that really struck a chord with me. And it made me wonder, you know, he's absolutely right. And I wonder which gospel is giving us the real Jesus and which are just the legendary accretion that came on top of that. And very long story, very short, um, started looking into seeing how we could parse out what's the real Jesus from all the legendary baloney uh, that came later. Um, so it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a really intriguing question. And yeah. like for, for me, um, a, a friend in about 2008 introduced me to the Jesus puzzle by Earl Doherty, which you yeah. reference in your, in your book. And yeah. uh, the thing that really struck me was that Philo of Alexandria um, uh, wrote about so much about Jesus, but didn't mention him. And, and that was like that was like the first clue for me that there was something really wrong here, and and so so in in reading nailed, um, yeah. sorry sorry to just jump in on on, <laughs> but uh, but we uh, one it it's like um, a uh, you've got Jesus on trial in a court and you're right. the um, uh, prosecutor, and uh, and you're uh, bringing up all of this um, evidence and and it's like um the the judge and jury had fully expected that jesus was completely innocent but uh, as you go through this evidence people start to think hey wow you know maybe we were wrong uh, <laughs> so we'll we'll go through th some of that but sorry yeah back to so, you Dave. well I'm, I'm glad you mentioned earl doherty because like it, when I started looking into his historicity, that was the first time I realized somebody else was also questioning uh, the historicity. And then, of course, the floodgates opened. I realized people have been questioning it since the second century, you know, um, and uh, that really blew my mind. But and, uh, even even more so, if you say the second century, but then uh, you look at Paul, you look at Mark, and right. like if there actually wasn't a Jesus, then they must have known that. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Um, well, we're, it's, and there's some trickiness to unpack there. There's so much to unpack, really. But um, when we ask what the early Christians thought of Jesus, the further we go back into what we know about early Christianity, the more variegated it is and the more non-heterogeneous it is. Sorry, non-homogeneous it is. We get all these different kinds of Jesuses, uh, whether... There were Christians that thought he was an angel. There were Christians that thought he was the first born of creation, the first thing created by God, um, the homostasis of God, if you will. Um, the, um, and there's also all these different views on, you know, what, what he was and what he was, but, but not so much on what he did and what he taught and what he said. And if you take Christianity before Mark's gospel, and Christianity after Mark's gospel, they're very different animals. They talk about Jesus very differently. And that, that's always, that was one of the first red flags for me too, is that today when a pastor wants to tell you about Jesus, he goes straight to the gospels and starts telling you, well, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. Um, and yet we don't see that with Paul. We don't see that with the book of Hebrews. We, we don't see that with any of the the early Christian authors that they mention, even though most of what we get is at, at least ostensibly through Paul, um, which is a weird thing too for the first century or so of early Christianity. Now, David, let's just go through the 10 myths in order and uh, sure. just a bit of a whirlwind tour of- Yeah, uh, because there's a lot to unpack with all of them, but yeah, yeah we can give a quick- how well, well just, just, just a couple of minutes on, on each of, of the myths. So the idea that Jesus was a myth is ridiculous. Now, what does that mean? Well, I mean, I get so many, I used to get so much pushback from our fellow atheists, or my fellow atheists, um, that just said, oh, of course there was a Jesus, 
to deny that would be like denying the earth is round or the, the moon landing or Holocaust denial. Um, and it really isn't the case. Um, the more we look into, the closer you look at, at Jesus, the more questionable it, the evidence is. Whether or not there really was a Jesus, even whether or not Christianity is true, the state of the evidence for Jesus is very, very dodgy. Mm. Okay, and so Jesus was wildly famous, but yes, they love to say how he was the cornerstone of all human history, and yet then they immediately back up and say, but there was no reason for any contemporaries to take notice of him. And if we take the gospels at face value, and I'm not advising that we do, but if we do, if there's any truth to them at all, that's that's completely out the window. There's just no way you can you can have your cake and eat it too, as far as, uh, and I tell, I'll talk about this at the end of the book too. I say, one of the paradoxes for me is that either he did these Americans amazing miracles, or at least taught these amazing revolutionary new things, and yet nobody outside his cult seemed to notice for the better part of a century or more, or contrapuntally, he didn't do these things, didn't teach these amazing things, and yet, as soon as he's dead, we have all these feuding little house cults, not just in the Galilee, not just in Jerusalem, but all over the Roman Empire that can't agree about the first things about his life and his career and who he was and what he was. Um, that is one of the, that's one of the things that boils down to for me is, is we've got that weird paradox um, that makes me think there's something not quite right here. I note you're good friends with Richard Carrier and uh, his book on the historicity of Jesus, Why We May Have Reason for Doubt, came out a couple of years after Nailed, but Richard had been uh, working on this um, topic for a couple of years and, and helped you with his book. And one of the themes that Richard picks up is um, really the, the problem that Christian apologists have, that they, they often say stuff that uh, when you when you look for the justification of what they yeah. say, uh, you find that it's it's absurdly false. So, like this yeah. argument that that Jesus uh, is as well attested as Julius Caesar, uh, like it, it's something yeah. that sort of comes rolls off the tongue for preachers, and you know they say, or they'll say there's like fifty different contemporary witnesses for Jesus, which like, nothing could be further from the truth, nothing, and yeah. I went out of my way to make sure that point gets driven home in the book and nailed. Yeah. And so what about uh, Josephus? Yeah, for, for those who don't know, <coughs> excuse me, Flavius Josephus was a Judean historian in the first century, the late first century, I should say. Um, and so much of what we know about first century Judea comes from his writings. Um, but he's probably best known today for these two passages that are claimed where he talks about Jesus. And one of them, and this is a very nutshell, because again, we spent a whole chapter on this. One of them is a forgery. No one denies it's a forgery. What they've done is they've moved the, the goalposts to say, well, it's not a complete forgery. It started out as something he really said, and then Christians uh, played around with it, which is not implausible, but completely doesn't follow the evidence we have. It's like, it, no, the whole thing, is rotten from top to bottom and does not fit in for multiple reasons. Um, that's the most famous, it's called the, the Testimonium Flavianum. Um, there's another one, the, the so-called James reference where he talks about James, the brother of Jesus. And that's clearly not even talking about James, the James we think of as the brother of Jesus. It's talking about uh, Jesus, son of Damnius, and the brother is not uh, it, it's Jacob, for instance, not James, but it's not the James that we're used to thinking of as the early Christian church leader. The story makes no sense whatsoever if it's about anybody involved with the Christian movement in the first century. It makes perfect sense if it's about the very Jesus that they mention in the passage itself. So I'm, I'm a little surprised that, that people are still beating the horse on that second reference. Uh, well, but, but, but it, it illustrates, I suppose, the nature of the rationalizations that are involved with, with ap apologetics and, and how uh, evangelical fundamentalist religion really needs there to be a historical Bingo. Jesus. 
And so, true. So, and, and so they're they, so they have to um, rationalize and uh, ignore um, the uh, the evidence in order yeah. to uh, to justify their position. And we'll see that again and again and again throughout Christian history and even today in Christian standard reference works in biblical translations, you see that happening all the time. And the fact is, if those two passages in Josephus are interpolated and are uh, a forgery, that means we have no corroborating evidence for Jesus for the entire first century or more of Christianity. So that's why they cling on to it with such tenacity. It's not because the evidence is good. It's because that's literally all they have to help nail down the corroboration for the Gospels. But that tenacity, I think, brings um, church historians um, into uh, popular disrepute because, mm. like the way I look at it, you know, I, I look at what uh, what you're saying and you know the evidence from uh, from the ancient times, and then I, I read people just flatly denying it. You know, they'll say. Yeah. They'll say there's a broad consensus that uh, Josephus actually wrote the Testimonium Flavianum, which um, is uh, just flies in the face of the whole profession of history, doesn't it? Yeah. And you mentioned Bart Ehrman uh, earlier. It's like one of the things I love about Bart Ehrman is he's done such an amazing job of pulling the curtain back on biblical studies and the problems and the biases of biblical studies that have been going on from the beginning. And I noticed that all his critics who wrote books in answer to his books like Jesus Interrupted and, and uh, 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 Misquoting Jesus, they never say he's wrong about what he's saying. They only said, oh, no, we're not hiding this. We're not keeping this from people. You know, it's, it's just hilarious to see them backpedal so quickly. Uh, but then very strangely, uh, Bart Ehrman wrote his book, Did Jesus Exist?, in which he, um, he seemed to, uh, uh, well, he, he um, aggressively uh, attacked yeah. the claim that jesus was was fictional and yeah. and attributed as i mentioned um to that response where uh, again you know i thought that uh, ehrman's uh, quality of argument was very poor in in that very. Book. yeah i was going to say mythicists like me weren't disappointed with the book because we thought he was going to agree with us we were disappointed because he thought we thought we were going to get the best defense of historicity and that it would help clear out the dead wood from all the, the, the bullshit mythicist arguments that are out there that aren't worthy and need to be done away with. Uh, but he didn't even do that. He seems to just lump everything he's heard and thought about mythicism since the 90s, thinking it's still being said, thinking it's still being argument, and thinking all these different schools of thought are one and the same. Um, it really is just kind of frustrating to see how little attention he pays to what mythicists are actually arguing and what's more how close what he's arguing is to what they're arguing at least i'm talking about the peer-reviewed mythicists yeah. um yeah, yeah so uh, like a lot of that's poisoned the well unfortunately with uh, in terms of the, uh, the popular perceptions around this debate because bart ammon uh, has a you know public platform where uh, somebody yeah. like you is finds it much harder to get an audience i imagine well and here's the thing though when I wrote Nailed in 2010, I got so much pushback from atheists that I went ahead and wrote Jesus Mything in Action to address the objections I got, not from Christians, but from atheists who were trying yeah. to say, oh, no, there was definitely a guy named Jesus, you know. Um, and I'm saying, no, there wasn't even a mere mortal because this, 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 this. Um, I would love to have somebody like Bart Ehrman even criticize that book or Richard's book or any seriously any book that's been written in the last 20 years engage um, in civil and courteous dialogue even to let point out our errors and missteps but instead he just throws out these straw men and laughs at them like oh all mythicists agree that the uh, nazareth never existed it's like all oh, mythicists think this all mythicists think that it's like have you not seen Richard Carrier and I criticizing people like Joseph Atwill and his Roman providence theories or uh, fill in the blank, you know, anybody who, who anybody who, who says that Christianity came, you know, hundreds of years later, a thousand years later um, or a hundred years earlier. It's it's there's so much uh, he doesn't know about what's being argued. And it's it, it is frustrating. It yes, is frustrating. Okay. But I, was, that, that, I meant Wrong. to say um that what happened in Nailed 
when I wrote Jesus Mending in Action in 2017, the reaction was completely different from people. And instead of people saying, oh no, that's 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 pseudo histories, they were saying, oh yeah, I never thought that Jesus was real. I was like, where were you? Where were you seven years ago? But that's how much it's changed in just seven years. And so mythicism isn't going away. Um, I think it's always gonna be on the pariah of biblical studies because biblical studies by its very nature is always going to be predominantly theologically based. Well, um, maybe, maybe not. I, I would, uh, I, I would um, beg to differ there, David. But that's well. We'll come back to that. I, I just sure. wanted to uh, to comment one one last comment about Josephus. The thing sure. that really struck me was um, reading the chapter in um, the ancient theologian Origen's book uh, against Celsus, where yes. he discusses the exact chapter where the Testimonium Flavianum is, and uh, is in a book that whose purpose is to prove that Jesus was real against these right. critics who, who think he was fake, but he right. doesn't notice this text. He doesn't exactly. notice exactly the one passage that would have sealed his argument. He doesn't know exists. And what's really damning about that is that same church father origin, the guy who did discover the Flavianum, he got his copy of or that book from origin. This is Eusebius. It's yes, Eusebius. It's like somehow, even the guy who owned the book before him, nobody noticed this passage for 300 years, and nobody knows it again until Jerome. I think it's, it's, it's so it's a, a half millennium of nobody except this one guy noticing this passage in Josephus, even the guy who owned the very book before him. Um, and it's not that Christians just didn't care about Josephus, Christian fathers loved Josephus, they were constantly quoting him just the way Origen does, but they never quote him on what we quote him on. So it's just one of the many reasons that we know that that Testimonium Flavinianum is completely nonsensical. It's a forgery. So David, uh, did eyewitnesses write the Gospels? Did who now? Did eyewitnesses write the Gospels? Here's the thing. I always was told they did. I always assumed they were. It says right there, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I remember when my pastor as a Southern Baptist said, admitted me, yeah, it's probably not written by them. That blew my Christian mind. And then, you know, years later, now that I'm an atheist, it's like, holy cow, not only do they not claim to be eyewitnesses and clearly aren't, the anachronisms, the mistakes they make and the, the slips they make, like saying, and this is believed to the Jews to this day, or so many people are writing gospels now, I thought I would examine the story that was handed down to our generation, as Luke says, um, before he steals Matthew and Mark's uh, story line, basically. Um, yeah, so not only were eyewitnesses not uh, the authors of the Gospels, but they were falsely attributed to eyewitnesses, even though they don't claim to be, don't, they don't read like it, and they're clearly, the synoptic problem shows us that they are stealing from each other, um, mostly from Mark, the first Gospel. Um, or as he called it, the good news of Jesus, the son of God. He never called it the, the gospel according to Mark. All those names came later in the second century. Mm. Yeah, so look, let's let's just go on. Uh, to, uh, to, are the gospels consistent in their picture of Jesus? You know, and it's funny, our first original gospel, Mark, the funny thing about it is it's the most low frills, low rent, no frills Jesus that we have of all four. Um, he's fallible, he's human, he gets cranky sometimes, he tries to do miracles and messes up and then he has to try again. Um, all these things that we do not think of as being worthy of our savior. By the time we get to the last gospel that was in the canonical gospels, John, he's like Superman without a Clark Kent. I mean, he is constantly doing everything perfectly and letting everybody know that he and the father are one. It's like, how did he not get stoned for blasphemy two minutes out of the gate? Um, and that's just the way they portray their superhero-ness. That's the way they portray their personality. There's differences, not just in the portrayal and not just in the teachings, but in the events that happened. And for instance, all three synoptic gospels follow Mark's uh, reason for um, Jesus getting crucified. It's the cleansing of the temple. But John, he likes that section so much, he makes that the way Jesus kicks off his career by cleansing the temple. And when he finally gets in trouble with the Pharisees, 
It's for a completely different reason. It's for raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus doesn't even appear in the other gospels. That's how different these things are. And it always kills me when Christians say, oh, but they're so detailed. And det it's like, yeah, they're so detailed. Why don't you see how well those details match up just in the last week or so of Jesus's life? They're not telling the same story, just as just the same way that Matthew and Luke aren't telling the same story about the nativity. Yeah. So we've got some uh, pretty big contradictions. And, and I think that that cleansing the temple one is is an example of where you've got uh, two books that have just got completely contradictory accounts of of history then yeah. you you start to wonder about uh, you know is this uh, a sort of poetic allegory or is it an actual record of of what happened and i think mark gives it away right at the beginning of his book i mean if you didn't know that all of these passages were actually taken from the, the Jewish scriptures. Um, if you didn't have Matthew telling him, that's exactly what he's doing. But if you just, if you weren't aware of that, even at the beginning of his gospel in Mark 4, 11, he has his Jesus say something really remarkable that still blows my mind, even as an atheist. He's talking to his inner circle of disciples and he says, this is why I teach in parables. Otherwise, I tell you the truth so you'll know. But I teach in parables. Otherwise, those outside our little club, our little circle here, they would turn from their sins and be saved. That blows my mind. It makes perfect sense if Mark is describing a mystery faith Jesus, one that you have to be in the club to know his secret teachings and you have to decipher them through his the lens that he gives you. Makes no sense the way we think of Jesus as somebody who came to earth to save everybody from their sins through his well, death on the cross. So it, it suggests that the uh, method of parables uh, is actually much more widespread. Uh, like, you know, we think of the Good Samaritan as a parable, mm -hmm. but we, yeah. we tend not to think of the uh, the passion story and, you know, the cleansing of the temple. Like that's not a parable, that's that's a, a historical event. In the exactly, and I think that's the, the crucial thing about this, no pun intended, is that, Mark is telling us that this whole thing is a parable. This And it's, it's like, when you see where he's getting his source material, of course it's an allegory. This over here is an allegory for that. This over here is an allegory for that. All the the unhistorical, the inhistorical, the ahistorical parts of the gospel that don't make sense historically make perfect sense as allegory. And I'm thinking especially of his ex trial and execution. The, the 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 problems with that trial are so unhistorical they just dogpile on each other super fast um but as a allegory for yom kippur everything about that whole business with him and barabbas and Pilate washing his hands the whole thing even even the the, the cursing of the fig tree uh earlier in the story um this all makes perfect sense as allegories so you've got the scapegoat story can you explain that yeah, I, and I go into more uh, detail about this in the book, but basically everything, single aspect of Yom Kippur, where you have two goats, uh, one is released unharmed into the wilderness, bearing the sins of Israel, murder and sedition, and the other is a perfect sacrifice without flaw. It's sacrificed for to, to shed you know its blood for, for the salvation of Israel. That's exactly what's happening in the Barabbas story. Um, you've got two Jesuses. Well, uh, that's because a Barabbas is Aramaic for son of the father. And in some medieval texts in Syria, his name is actually Jesus Barabbas. Um, so we have two Jesuses, two sons of the father. One of them is guilty of murder. One of them is guilty of sedition against Rome. Um, but he's released into the wilderness unharmed. While the perfect flawless sacrifice, Jesus, he is, his blood is shed as our, our Passover lamb um, for the sins of Israel. Um, yeah, every so, point yes. of that works perfect as Yom Kippur. So it's like uh, Mark took it from the Jewish tradition of Yom Kippur and, yeah. uh, and used that as his model for, right. uh, for the story of uh, 
of um, the uh, of Barabbas uh, being released, which is which doesn't match with like this idea that in the next question history confirms the Gospels. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, like that. Uh, you know, would Pilate have uh, have, have uh, uh, agreed to all of that? Yeah, that's a prime example of how the Gospels portrayal does not match what we know of history. Um, a funny thing about not only would, would would yeah, Pilate did not get in trouble with Rome because he was afraid to find fault with Jesus. He got in, in trouble with Rome finally because he massacred too many Jews and Samaritans. Um, one of the uh, uh, our writers, I think it was Philo, said that he would constantly do what the Jews pleaded with him not to do and never do what they begged him to do. Um, yeah, he was a monster, just an absolute monster. And this dithering little hand-wringing uh, Nancy boy that we see in the Gospels, that was just so worlds away from the real Pilate. Um, another funny thing about that, the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the huge enemies of Jesus and his disciples, because the real life Pharisees were enemies of the first Christians generations later. But in actual life, the Pharisees would have loved somebody like Jesus. He hated those fat cats uh, that were sucking up to the Romans, the toadies, the Sadducee parties, just as much as the Pharisees did. Um, there's an ironic verse that says he didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, except he did. And like many of our favorite teachings from Jesus, are actually taken directly from the, the Pharisees. Um, so they would have loved somebody like Jesus. He, they was, he was their kind of guy. Um, so it's it's one of those ironies of history that Christianity has is, is just warped the truth like a balloon animal and just twisted it into some other shape. So what, what do you mean when you say history confirms the gospels? Or, or what do uh, Christians mean when they when they say that? Well, they'll say things like, oh, look at all these little details that Luke gets right in his story. Therefore, these stories are true. Or what my favorite is when they, they quote some Victorian era Christian biblical historian who says things ridiculous like, oh, Luke is the best historian of all time. It says right there in Luke 1, he's a great historian. Um, he tells us himself. Uh, the appeals to authority and the appeals to um uh, you could call it the appeal to window dressing, I suppose, uh, because the things that, that, for instance, Luke puts in his gospel, not only are they wrong often, but you can see him like wanting to put in celebrities of the first century to beef up his story. Wanting to, he takes things from Josephus, puts them in his story to beef it up as history, even though he usually gets it wrong, which is how we know that he's stealing from Josephus and not the other way around. Um, and Mark makes so many mistakes about basic Judaism that Matthew goes into overtime to correct his mistakes, uh, while Luke is more apt to just repeat them. Um, and it's not just it's not just everyday life in Palestine, but it's it's even like quotes of scriptures. Jesus gets wrong in Mark's gospel, uh, and Matthew has to correct it. And uh, yeah, there's many, 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 many things like that. And uh, not just yeah. history, but geography you know, and the archaeology. Yeah. Well, that's that's the next question. You know, like there's uh, there were all of those um, uh, stories that um, the Empress Helena, uh, the mother of uh, Emperor Constantine, uh, discovered when she uh, visited yeah. the Holy Land in the fourth century. Uh, you know, there were the pieces of the true cross and there was right. the, uh, the tomb of, of Christ. And uh, there was the birthplace of, uh, of of Jesus in in Bethlehem, and, and uh, you know that's been, that's been taken by the church as it, it uh, you know, classic evidence. And you know pilgrims go to those places all the time, and uh, you know really venerate all of those relics. And oddly enough, before the Empress Helena did that, we have no record of anybody doing that or venerating any place in Jerusalem. Even in early Christian writings, we don't have anything like that. Um, so that's funny too. Yeah, um, getting off track a little bit, but you can say the same things about the martyr stories that we've got from early Christianity. And um, Candida Moss's book, The Myth of Persecution, does an amazing job of showing how Christian scholars over the years have debunked their own mythology about Christian martyrs and how some of them are just completely made up. Some of them are stolen from Jewish martyr stories, ironically enough. Um, almost nothing, virtually nothing we have 
involving a Christian persecution in the early parts of Christianity is true. Mm. Nothing holds up. Yeah. And uh, but so a lot of this material is really open to ridicule these days, unfortunately. For uh, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So what about Paul and the epistles? How, how does Paul's writing relate to corroborating the Gospels? Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that when you look at the way Christians talk about Jesus before the Gospels and after the Gospels, they're very different. Um, Paul, well, one thing for Paul, of his 13 letters, only half of them are accepted by scholars as being more or less genuine. Um, six of them are completely out the window. We know they weren't written by him. Uh, three of them are maybe close enough to his writings and thought to be part of a uh, later disciple, you know, a, uh, a later school of thought from his own uh, Christian movement. But three of them are just completely uh, uh, forgery, just flat out forgery, not even trying to match up what the original Paul said. Um, and it's worth pointing out that even our genuine letters of Paul appear to be mashups of multiple letters and appear to have been multiply redacted, multiply edited. Um, and so it, it gets very dodgy very soon. And it also is weird. I don't remember if I got into this in, in Nailed or in Jesus Mything in Action, but it's also weird that of all the Christians in the first century, we don't have anything really by Peter or any of the other people who claim to be apostles. We just have forgeries in their names later. Um, but we don't have any church records. We don't have any authentic church history. We just have Acts, which contradicts everything Paul says at every point where they overlap. Um, so one of those two is lying, either Luke or Paul or possibly both, but they can't both be true. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a very, and again, this is all true, whether or not there was a real Jesus or not, and whether or not Christianity is true or not. Whether any of those things are true, the evidence for them points in a completely different direction for what it's worth, for what it's so, worth. So Christians tend to read back the gospels into the epistles, and yet there's this problem of, uh, you know, uh, that, Paul never places Jesus in time and place. And uh, that's it's, it's a really major problem. As you were saying, there's uh, the Jesus before the gospel and after, after the gospel and them being completely different. Like, and so it's, it's like that uh, Paul started off with uh, a skeleton or an outline of, of Jesus as a, uh, as a cosmic sort of figure. Being, you know, what, then, they, what, what Richard calls a celestial Jesus, yeah. Or a, um, celestial, a celestial Jesus, yeah. Yeah, and he's talking to Christians in his letters. He's talking to Christians who like don't believe there's such thing as life after death, don't believe there's anything as a resurrection of the dead, which blows my mind. It's like, how are you going to church in the first century if you don't believe these things, for starters? Um, yeah. Um, so much more diverse. Been, but, but what about the... Um, the the one of the things when you've got a real uh, historical movement where you've got a founder and then somebody who takes over from the founder, like I think of the example of communism with uh, Lenin and Stalin, and sure. uh, you know Stalin quotes Lenin all the time and uh, you know venerates Le and he says as Lenin said, um, yes, and, uh, yes, uh, you know, to, to same thing with Brigham Young and Joseph Smith in the Mormon okay. Church. Same thing with the two founders of the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, yeah. It's interesting how you get a charismatic founder figure, and then you have the guy who has good business sense who comes on his heels. Um, you see that a lot. Yeah, but so you know, cool. while we're on that subject, I want to say something really interesting, because over this last year, one of the things I've been saying all along was that as a side effect of looking into the historicity of Jesus, how many Buddhists would come up to me and say, yeah, we're having the same debates in our circles, whether the Buddha existed or not. And ex-Muslims would come up to me and say, yeah, we're having the same debates in our circles, whether Muhammad existed or not. And that blew my mind. I mean, he, we're talking the sixth and seventh century here. It's like, well, of course, Muhammad existed until they started telling me the problems they had with the early uh, evidence for Muhammad and things that I took for granted just as much as I did for Jesus uh, 
the Islamic world has about having contemporary witnesses to to Muhammad and having family trees descended from him, um, all these things, um, to the point where when I last did a, a talk for uh, Global Center for Religious Research and for um, Recovery from Religion Foundation, I just kind of skimmed over the top 10 and I just want to check and see what the rest of their status was. If that was, if this, if I was seeing just these three or if there's more to be found among the other religions. Well, when you take the top 10 world religions, every single one of them from Sikhism to Buddhism to everything in between has that same dodgy once upon a time feeling right out of the box. It's like none of them start with contemporary eyewitnesses. They all start a few generations removed. Um, that blew my mind. That still blows my mind. And I think I'm going to have to write a book just about that um, next. Mm. See, I, I, it reminds me of when Voltaire said, if God didn't exist, it would have been necessary to invent him. I, I tend to think the same thing about Jesus, that you yeah. know, if Jesus didn't exist, it it would have been necessary to invent him in the the social and cultural and political context of of, of the time. Absolutely, and you could say the same thing about Zoroaster. You could say the same thing about Moses. You could say the same thing about Muhammad, um, and any number of others. They had to have, you know, there was a void to be filled, and they filled it. Um, and that, I mean. They, there's no reason that they have to be mythical. There's no reason, there's nothing implausible about them all existing. But when you see the pattern and every single one of them just happens to not have very good evidence from their founder figure's biography and all the biography starts growing in the centuries after his death. Um, it's like it's, a psychological syndrome. It's, it goes from saying, oh, it, it's weird that there could have been no Jesus. That makes no sense to, of course, there was no Jesus. That's the norm for religious founder figures. That's the but, biggest takeaway for me. So Paul had plenty of opportunities to quote from Jesus to settle problems, didn't he? But he never did. Yeah, never did. And even in Acts, uh, you got Peter having these visions to establish things that, well, didn't Jesus already establish this, you know, uh, three, you know, two generations removed. Or so, um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So like we're talking a bit, I think that leads into myth number nine, Christianity began with Jesus and his apostles. Yeah. Sure. does not look that way. It sure does not. In fact, uh, I think it was Robert Price who pointed out that when you look at the four gospels, none of them agree on who the apostles are. Um, and that's funny when you see lists of the apostles, you'll have uh, somebody like Thaddeus, who's also called Labinius, who's also called blah, blah, blah. Um, they hold multiple names because the gospels don't agree on uh, who they were. Um, they agree on the number 12. The number 12 is very important for them. Um, even when, even after Judas is dead, they're still calling the group the 12. Um, uh, well, like before, Paul says that Jesus appeared to Peter and the twelve. That's a, you. You you have an interesting uh, observation about that. Yeah, and again, these are not my ideas; they're not original to me. But um, it's very funny that when Paul talks about what he knows about Jesus, it's always through my readings in the Scripture and through my personal revelation to him. He never tells anything remotely like the, the Damascus story, the road to Damascus story. Um, and everything he says, oh, we know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We know that he rose again on the third day because it's according to scripture, according to the scripture. Kata grapha. It's always because that's what the scripture tells us. But never anything about Jesus's career and teachings and life. No. Nope. And he even disagrees with Jesus here and there. Um, which is odd. Um, and the funny thing about, the, we were talking about uh, 1 Corinthians, that passage now. Um, the other weird thing about that is when it talks about the people that, that Jesus appeared to after his death, none of that matches any of the gospels. And yet Christians act like, here's proof positive. And it's like, tell me what gospel this is in, where he appears to Peter and all the gospels for the priests. Like, where are the women at the tomb? Where's the two guys on the road to Damascus? Where, you know, when, when did this 500 people in, uh, at Passover show up? You know, it's like at Pentecost, I should say. Um, none of that matches any of our Gospels. 
and yet so if we're, just, yeah so if we're in a in a in a court of law and uh, you know you've been uh, laying out this stuff as the prosecutor and the and the the jury's listening to this and and they had they had come at the start as i said you know thinking oh look he's obviously innocent i mean what yeah. what what are what are they thinking now about like you know there's some pretty big holes in the story aren't there <laughs> well i mean not to get ahead of ours but i did put my penultimate chapters can jesus be saved and i wrote down all the things that would be different in the bible and the new testament in early first century judean history if there was just a mortal dude named jesus um and so many things would have to be different than they are now for me to even think there was just a guy named jesus or even several guys conflated to become a jesus um, and that's that's a bit that's a bit like what Richard Carrier talks about with Bayesian uh, reasoning, isn't it? You know, sure. it, it, this this uh, question: what what would the evidence be like if yes if these conditions uh, existed? And on the other hand, um, talking about the mystery faiths, everything we know about mystery faiths makes it look like Christianity is someone doing a Jewish version of the mystery faith. Um, and all the Christian apologists' arguments against that are so weirdly feeble and weak against that, and they have to like, they have to like define mystery faith out of existence for it not to apply to Christianity. But just looking at it objectively, if you went to a guy in the first century and say, "Hey, what's a mystery faith?" Okay, what would a Jewish version of mystery faith look like? Boom, you have Christianity. Right. So you've got this final myth, uh, Christianity was totally new and different. Uh, yeah. how, what's that mean? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, not only is it not his teachings that are different. I mean, we when we look at where the writers who created Jesus got their story, we see it from the Jewish scriptures, we see it from Greek influences, we see Cynic, we see Stoic, we see Pharisaical, uh, we see all these influences that came together to create these different images of Jesus um, in our four Gospels. Mm -hmm. And that 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 process just has never ended. I mean, we're still cranking out Jesus's to suit ourselves. Um, so, David, you've, right you've had a big interest in evolutionary thinking. And uh, yeah. one, there's the, the whole field of memetics. Uh, of uh, cultural evolution, and there's yeah. this sense that uh, there's a, a strong uh, causal similarity between how culture evolves and how genetics evolves, yeah. and yeah. and so so you've got this sense of Jesus as somehow evolving, uh, the stories evolving uh, in Absolutely. culture. Absolutely, and even if there really was a real Jesus. As Robert Price pointed out, there isn't one anymore because everything we think we know about that Jesus comes from writings that have nothing to do with anyone who actually lived. And again, that's whether there was a real Jesus at the bottom of that, the kernel of truth at there or not. Um, to the point where uh, historians like Kurt Knoll are increasingly saying it doesn't even matter if there was a real dude or not because we can, uh, we can totally take. Uh, stock of what christianity was and 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 understand it for what it is whether there was a founder figure or not um well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, it, like i've had this debate and i i think it's a really central question in um philosophy you know the the, the and and psychology as well like if it's true that uh, jesus was invented and, yeah. and yet for the last 2000 years the uh, you know central dogma of uh, western civilization has been that uh, jesus was the son of god who was incarnate on earth then yeah. we uh, we our, our culture is grounded in a big lie like it's it's a fantasy it's it's a delusion and one of the things i like in buddhism is this idea that uh, delusion is a cause cause of suffering Mm. And, and so, like, if we've got this big delusion that's been um, that's dominated our um, uh, our uh, society, then yeah. that that is a problem. Yeah, and when you see when you see what human history, or I should say, Western history, has looked like when the church was on top, 
We call that the dark ages now. It wasn't until we started getting away from that, getting into rationalism, into humanism, into the enlightenment um, that that went away. Um, and we're still wrestling with religion. And we're still wrestling with things like communism that are like political forms of religion that have all this, the same drawbacks as religions do. Um, Mm. With none of the the free thought and none of the humanism um and I, and i'm glad you brought up evolution too because increasingly i mean i've always been fascinated by the evolution of of religion and the evolution of jesus and the evolution of christianity um and even before that when you get into older religions and even prehistoric religions and even pre-human factors that that as just by being social animals things that later evolutionary survival mechanisms that would later be co-opted by religion um it goes back as far as human and beyond um and human imagination is what's driving all these things and the thing about now is we talk about well maybe you know western civilization is built on a delusion but the truth is there's so many kinds of Jesuses. There's so many kinds of Christianities. There's so many kinds of other religions around. Um, I don't know if you were, know the word uh, mythomachy, but it's basically a war of myths. And that's, I think, what our human history has been, is a war of myths, especially yeah. when we talk about religion. I, I, I just go back. I, uh, one of my favorite books is the LaRousse Encyclopedia of Mythology. And Robert ah. Graves wrote the introduction. And uh, he commented that what tends to happen when you have a war of myths is that the uh, the new supreme god uh, takes over, the old god completely yeah. disappears, but then a generation later, the old god comes back in a subordinate capacity. And, yeah. and I, I, I think that we're seeing this uh, today with the evolution of mythology. It's, it's part, like one of the things that I'm really interested in is how uh, indigenous culture is returning mm. from that really heavy uh, repression that that occurred in in the uh, colonial periods and sure. uh, is, is uh, emerging back into respect and so yeah. you know Jesus as I suppose the god of the colonial conquest is um, is stepping down a bit in terms, in terms <laughs> of place in the pantheon. Yeah, it's interesting how how the the goddess Mary you know she keeps coming and going too in history. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Look, David, we'll just take another five minutes because I, I want to keep this uh, reasonably concise and it's been a fantastic chat, but I'm just going to put up on the screen the questions that were that I was, I was thinking about as uh, as I was rereading Nailed and um, uh, just uh, see if there's... Uh, uh, there's themes in here that uh, that perhaps we could pick up to uh, to conclude. So I hope you can you can read this and uh, sure. and and just perhaps offer some some final comments that uh, that reflect on some of these points. Um, could mythicism be compatible with a reformed scientific Christian faith? That's the question, isn't it? Um, it's interesting to me. Whenever I, I I always try to be careful when I say anything broad strokes about Christianity, because I came from a very specific Christian denomination, Southern Baptist, uh, super Protestant, super skeptical about uh, all the things. Um, and yet I don't even believe what the Southern Baptists believe. So I'm like super, super skeptical um, and have very strong ideas of what real Christianity is. Um, but the fact is, is there's never, ever just been one kind of Christianity. Um, so if I say mythicism is not compatible with Christians. There's always been some kind of Christians who say, you know what, it's okay if this is make-believe, it's still a framework that we can hang our hat on at the end of the day. Um, yeah, so like, I, for example, for, for me, you know, I, I come out of a very uh, liberal and critical uh, tradition where uh, yeah. I, I, I love the idea that, say, for example, the Sermon on the Mount is... Um, is a, a vision of how uh, human ethics could be in some far distant future. Uh, like, yeah. and so you know, these ideas like we're in a state of a fall from grace that resonates mm. with me mm. as and and you know, ideas like grace, you know, and salvation, like 
I don't like the idea of a heavenly afterlife. It just uh, it doesn't make any scientific sense. But sure. the idea of salvation as the transformation of the world, uh, the you know, Gnostic sense, if you will, yeah, yeah, um, um, yeah. It's it's interesting. I used to say talk about how evolution was like the Achilles heel of Christianity, but more and more Christians are finding ways to that make that compatible and talk about things like theistic evolution which makes no sense it's an oxymoron and yet it the fact is christians are making room even for just cognitive dissonance where it's like i'm a christian but i also believe we came from monkeys and we evolved over millions and millions of years and from and dinosaurs and all that um i don't know if mythicism is this going to be the same or not because i always thought mythicism would be kryptonite for christianity because you can make room for evolution, but can you really make room for the fact that there was no Jesus whatsoever? Um, and uh, maybe they can, you know, far be it but, for me to tell but, Christians what they But if, if, Paul, if Paul and Mark wrote their books uh, yeah. in the full knowledge that, uh, that Jesus was ah. imaginary, then uh, you often have, uh, like there's a, a book I really like called uh, Jesus Before Christianity by Nolan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's saying that, you know, the church over the centuries has been really corrupt, but uh, it's a bit like the Protestant Reformation, you know, the church mm. had been really corrupt, so we had to go back to the Gospels in order right. to find the authentic um, truth that uh, that provides the ethical foundation and meaning but now yeah. we're in a situation of like a new reformation of saying well when we uh, you know the church today is you know deeply corrupt with all of this uh, you know uh, false apologetic claims when yeah. we go back using our modern tools of of science and historiography we find that the argument that you're presenting in Nailed uh, is the most compelling explanation of Christian origins. So that starts to open up this question about, well, you know, was it a mystery uh, uh, secret uh, community? Uh, how can we explain the the early uh, origins yeah. of it at, in a way that uh, that that explores some of the ethics that uh, that are uh, that people really value in the gospel? Right. And another thing, just to dovetail with that is another question is if Christianity was all made up from the get-go, whether you want to call it a lie or a myth or a fable or whatever their their motives were, how much of it is what we can take and have some value of today? Um, and it's very interesting. I read a lot of books now by um, liberal Christian pastors and, and people like John Bishop Spong and uh, uh, another author friend who wrote um, uh, uh, Unprotected Texts, uh, and I'm blanking on her name, but she's a, a Baptist minister. And the takeaway when I read the way they engage with their Christianity, they don't put it all on God's back. They, they fully recognize that we as Christians have to make our Christianity. Does that make sense? We well, have to- It's a construction. It's a construction, it's an and and it's still under construction, and and so it's not um, a divine it, revelation from God. Well, this is the funny thing. It, there's this kind of juxtaposition. It's like, oh yes, God gave us this message. Our human fallibleness screwed it up, but we can find the good parts of it. And um, it, it seems to me it, that's giving away the game. That yeah, we are. You know, there's no Ten Commandments coming down from heaven. We are doing the hard work of sorting out these ethics and more importantly, getting rid of jettisoning the ones that don't work um, and don't serve us anymore. So it's it's a very interesting set of affairs. I, I think David will uh, wind up there, and uh, I really appreciate the chance to chat with you. It's uh, I think it's been a, a really good conversation, uh, covered some some really important material, and I'll I'll put the uh, the video up on YouTube, and uh, just uh, hope that we can uh, uh, just perhaps uh, we we might want to catch up again and uh, and uh, and and look at some of the other uh, issues that that come out of it. So. Thanks so much for uh, for your time today, and I'll just uh, ask if you have any any final comments before I stop the recording. Well, first of all, thanks so much, Robbie. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, 
it was occurring to me a few minutes ago that when we were talking about can is mythicism compatible with with christianity and it occurred to me that i think when i became an atheist for some reason ironically enough i became much more christ-like in my compassion for everybody um evolution taught me that everybody is we're all part of this planet we all belong here we are all connected to each other um none of us have you know an inside track to heaven that everybody else doesn't get you know we're not on noah's ark thumbing our noses at all the people getting rained on um and it's so maybe there is a way that being a staunch atheist and being a faithful christian can coexist in the same person yeah the way i the way i look at it uh is to say that um evidence and logic are the highest moral values mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, that's that's something that uh, we really need to have a fact-based approach to to history but then Absolutely. just to to conclude probably my favorite line in the bible is in the um, parable of the sheep and ghost goats where where jesus says um you'll be saved if you treat the least of the world as though they mm -hmm. were mm, yeah and uh, and to me that's a deeply evolutionary statement because among the least of the world i think there's the whole of biodiversity <laughs> so yeah. so, we, so we experience the the there's some sense of the sacred uh, there's something really precious about biodiversity and it's uh it's uh being uh destroyed by our modern industrial civilization with its fantasy comforting emotions of uh of of uh, the oh, historical right jesus the yeah, so yeah. so there's there's actually a really strong moral critique of the historical jesus story and how it's functioned in our society and we can find uh if we can use the bible to help uh build a critique of of that uh ethical uh problems of of modernity and christendom then uh then that can participate i think in a in a broader conversation about these topics sure sure because it's not that i don't think there's truth to be had in myths it's just when we mistake the truths of myths for the truths of empirical science as if they're the same thing that's when we get into trouble thanks so much david i'll uh, stop the recording at, at this point